the friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10 piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. This is Ben from Hudson. Get exclusive podcasts and more at patreon.com slash partners in crime, crime media. Just like I do. I'm Rebecca Lavoie, and this is Crime Writers On, the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts. And this week, this is not your grandfather's Perry Mason. We'll talk about the new HBO series that reimagines TV's most famous defense attorney as a 1930s private eye working on a brutal murder case. Then the question isn't just who would kill a Houston graduate student, but also why. That's the focus of Motive for Murder, the latest podcast from Dateline NBC. Joining me to get that done and more is my real-life husband and true crime co-author, former GB journalist, and love of my life, Kevin Flynn. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Rebecca. Also with us is journalist, true crime author, licensed private investigator, former defense investigator, and our certified cat lady, Laura Bricker. Hello, Laura. Hello, and I have never stolen a tie off of a dead corpse when I was a private <laughs> investigator. I'm just going to put that out there right now. Surprise. What about earrings? <laughs> well, I mean, if they were pearls, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Finally, the author behind the noir novels known as the City Trilogy, our favorite Doubting Thomas and host of the Strange Arrivals podcast, our resident cynic, Toby Ball. Hello, Toby. Hello, Rebecca. Kevin, you know what we have to do that we haven't done in a while? What do we have to do? We've got a true crime update. All right. Oh, should I do the thing? Let's try it. Ready? True. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, you want to give it a go? <laughs> true crime update. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Kevin, we'll get back to you doing true crime updates soon enough, right? I, I think so. I think so. I'm feeling good. <laughs> well, last week, of course, by the time the show comes out, it'll be a couple weeks ago, there was a very big piece of true crime news. Ghislaine Maxwell, long time girlfriend and co-conspirator of the alleged pedophile and billionaire Jeffrey Epstein was arrested. She was found hiding out in a place called Bradford, New Hampshire, which is about, I don't know, 10, 12 miles from where we're sitting right here in our basement podcast studio. Kevin Flynn, what did you think when you heard this news that Ghislaine Maxwell had been arrested by the FBI at this mansion hideaway in a tiny town, two towns over from our tiny town. That she was probably at our the same market basket that we go to. <laughs> she probably knows where your Dunkin' Donuts is. Of course. Well, I know where all the Dunkin' Donuts are. So, yeah. Toby? I thought it was funny. Her like hideout was like a very New Hampshire mansion mm. or what passes for a mansion in New Hampshire. I would live there. I have a question for you, Lara. Yeah. When I first heard this news, aside from the fact that I was stunned and amazed that Ghislaine Maxwell, international quasi-fugitive, I mean, she wasn't actually under arrest at that point, but she was definitely laying low on purpose. She purchased the house under an an assumed name through an LLC. Yeah. She had packages delivered under a different name. She clearly did not want to be found. Bradford, New Hampshire is, in my estimation... One of the best places you could hide in the entire world, and it never occurred to me before this arrest. Do you agree, Laura Bricker? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Bradford, New Hampshire is one of those places, you know, I grew up in Vermont, and I used to drive up Interstate 89 and pass that exit. I I don't even think I ever got off at that exit. There might have been a gas station, but I think that was pretty quickly clear when they interviewed people down at, like, the general store Mm. who were like, I don't know who the heck she is. 
I wouldn't have known her if I saw her, and I don't care. Because nobody listens to the news or watches the news in Bradford, New Hampshire. No. They go there on purpose to get away from things. To hide. I mean, but what was funny was that when this first broke, they were saying it was Bedford, New Hampshire. It was like, it was a Bedford or Bradford. And I'm like, it is definitely Bradford mm. because that is a much better place to hide. Bedford would have been like the stereotypical. I mean, there's a lot of McMansions there. Yep. Uh, Bradford is, is pretty remote. And I loved when they got the drone footage over her house. That's right. And uh, I would have liked to quarantine there during the pandemic. <laughs> it wouldn't have been so bad. Yeah. I have to say uh, one point of correction, Laura, there's actually no exit at Bradford, New Hampshire. The exit is in Warner, New Hampshire. Oh, that's Then it. you have to go down the road a piece to Bradford. All there is there at that exit is a market basket, a McDonald's, New Hampshire State Liquor Store, oh, and a gas station. I've gotten off at that exit before. <laughs> I have gotten off at that exit before. Yes. Yes. And there used to be a very lovely breakfast spot in Bradford called the Bradford Junction, which closed many years ago and made us very sad. So so you think Ghislaine Maxwell was looking for a place where she could get liquor, a Big Mac, and uh, some market back <laughs> to get cookies? Mm, yeah. 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 I did ask my checkout uh, young lady at Market Basket when I was there this weekend if anyone was chatting in the store about whether or not she'd been there. And she was like, who? Yeah. What again? I'm like, see, nobody reads the news there. Yeah. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying that they don't read the news. Go. It yeah. is the perfect place because nobody there cares about the news. And everybody's wearing masks. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. If Ghislaine Maxwell could walk by me with a mask on, I would never know. Exactly. All right. Are you guys ready to tackle our topic this evening? We are. Let's get it done. I haven't seen you in three months, EB. Yeah, it's been quiet out there, boy. Oh, I don't deny it. But this is a live one. 3 p.m. Wear your good suit. This is my good suit. HBO is out with a reboot of Perry Mason. But this time, Mason is not a 1950s defense attorney. Instead, he's a 1930s private dick working for a lawyer and investigating the case of a kidnapping gone wrong. What about the police? How's that? Well, they'll be on this hammer and tongs. Why not leave it to them? I'll be frank, Mr. Mason. I don't trust the Los Angeles Police Department to do the job that's needed. Neither would I. Emmy Award winner and my favorite hot guy, Matthew Reese, plays Perry Mason. The mystery includes police corruption, political power, a desperate housewife, and a charismatic radio preacher named Sister Alice. Blessed be the jury who will convict the devil. Blessed be the judge who will sentence the devil. Blessed be the hangman who will snap this devil's neck. Harry Mason is a stylized L.A. noir crime show with an all-star cast. Will Mason find the answers in Hollywood's underbelly? And will he get the case-clearing confession the character is known for? We are going to be talking about plot points for Perry Mason. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes. Kevin Flynn, I have a confession to make. Okay. I've never seen a single minute of the Perry Mason TV show. Have you? Uh, No, because it went off the air in like 1966. (laughs) Well, can you just like tell me what it was about and whether or not the show tracks with it at all? I mean, I don't want to sound ignorant, but it doesn't seem to. Ready for a history lesson? Yes. Okay, so Perry Mason is based on a a book series, uh, and the author's name is... As I forget. Earl Stanley Gardner. <gasps> Earl Stanley Gardner. Bing, 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 bing. And so there were a lot of movies and books about Perry Mason. And it was always like Perry Mason and the case of the lucky legs and the case of the mysterious nymph and stuff like this. And Perry Mason is a defense attorney. Mm. And the shtick was that he would investigate crimes and for the wrongly accused. Okay. And on the TV show, Perry Mason was played by Raymond Burr. Mm. What would happen? is that he would get, you know, the real killer would get up on the stand and every week he would get that person to confess to the crime. On the stand. On the stand. Yeah, that was sort of the the thing. The big finale was always... It would be like a Jack McCoy moment every single episode. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And he was like kind of genteel. Like he was like, I don't want to confuse him with... Uh... Atticus Finch? No, 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 no. What's the other show about? Like the Matt guy... Matlock? Yeah, the guy who wears <laughs> the, the, the seersucker suits. Matlock's derivative, yeah. In my mind, these are just like shows with old lawyer guys that I never watched because they ended before I was born. Right, yes. right. And so to bring this around, you know, in this, uh, I don't know if you can really call it a prequel or a reboot or whatever, there are a couple of familiar characters. Mm. Della Street okay. was 
was his legal assistant. On the TV show? On the TV show was and in the books. Was she a lesbian on the TV show? She was not. Okay. They were never romantic interests okay. in some of the books but they, they were. sparks, the two of them? Uh, no. Did she keep they him in were, line? Was she his She was Friday? just a very competent yeah. assistant yeah. that he could depend on. Okay. Um, he had a private detective himself working for him, and that was Laura Bricker. Really? No, it wasn't Laura Bricker. <laughs> it totally was. Oh, my God. That was Paul Drake. <laughs> Oh, and in th- then in the HBO series, Paul Drake is a, a black policeman. Yes, so that's going in a different direction. Also, police detective Holcomb was uh, his nemesis, who was always arresting the wrong guy. Okay, and Holcomb is also on this show, right? Yes. Okay, but a lot of none of the other characters I can tell are on. His the... lawyer mentor, played by John Lithgow, no. was not on this show. So this is no, all... and we know why. <laughs> we do now. That's true. But by the way, could we have picked a better thing where we have both a defense investigator and a noir, and, and noir novelist <laughs> on the panel? Honestly. Okay, I'm done talking, apparently. Just pretty take much it away. this TV show was like, HBO was like, we want to make something that Crime Writers On will review, which you know is how they make all their decisions mm-hmm. at HBO. And they should. Of course. Laura Bricker. Yeah. A show in which the very, very, very sexy... Matthew Reese plays a private investigator working for the defense. What do you think of this concept? Does it like read true to you, Laura Bricker? Um, this is a concept after my very heart. Um, you know, these are the stories I love. I can't say I'm loving this as much as I hoped I would, but I love the fact that we have, you know, this team of people that are going to help the wrongfully accused. Um, it, it ends up being mother eventually. And the fact that they are out there like really going out doing what I call like gumshoe shoe leather reporting out there on the street, you know, getting to the bottom of what really happened and making sure that justice is really served. So it's definitely the concept is something that's definitely after my heart. Although I have to say that Perry Mason is just about the most curmudgeonly person <laughs> and most tormented person. Everybody's up to something. Everybody got an angle. Hiding something. And everybody is guilty. And so I, I, it took me a while to warm up to him. Mm. I mean, as I said, I think I sent you guys a text. I said, Perry Mason, the only person who doesn't smile when he, am I allowed to say that? Does it? <laughs> <laughs> Perry Mason, the only one who doesn't smile when he has conjugal relations. Right, right. <laughs> and his bed breaks and he still doesn't smile. I'm like, it doesn't seem like fun. He is really tormented. I don't think he or his like, uh, airplane flying neighbor, either one of them are having a particular <laughs> lot of fun during those sex scenes. But anyway, we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> Laura, are you familiar with Matthew Reese? Did you watch The Americans in which he played Philip Jennings? I did watch um, the first few seasons of The Americans and yes, I, I definitely have a little crush on him. And you have you ever heard his his accent in real life, he speaks with such a strong Welsh accent that he, almost he needs subtitles. It's indiscernible. <laughs> so we're doing the scene and I thought it was going rather well. I was off book and, all, and, every, and everything. And she wound up this slap that must have started uh, the day before. <laughs> <laughs> Hit me so hard. And, and both Joe and Gavin went, you took that slap so well. And I went, because I didn't even know what state I was in. <laughs> it's like watching Shetland or something, um, <laughs> which is definitely one of my favorite shows. But also I'm like, what did Jimmy Perez just say? I'm not really sure. That's so right. yeah, um, thanks thanks to you, Rebecca. I have now watched um, Matthew Reese speak how he actually speaks. <laughs> but I don't think that that is a factor in the fact that he's so gloomy it's in not. the beginning of the show. It's not. <laughs> it, it just more goes to underscore my point. Nicole Kidman has no excuse. No excuse for not being able to do an American <laughs> accent. If Matthew Reese can do one that's that curmudgeonly and that good and that consistent. Yeah. No excuse, Nicole Kidman. You heard it here. Yeah. Toby Ball, uh, this is a very dark show. It starts with one of the darkest things you can possibly do. That was also the opening conceit of one of my other all time favorite TV shows, Battlestar Galactica, the reboot. They kill a baby in the opening sequence of this show. Toby, does it get more noir than starting right there? It's sort of evocative of like the Lindbergh baby and all these like stories from that part of the century. What did you think? Yeah, the setup was very good noir. Not only did they kill a baby, they then stitched its eyes open so that it would look alive. 
when they had it, uh, I guess there's a, like a streetcar that goes like two blocks or something. It was kind of strange. But anyway. <laughs> Listen, walking down that hill isn't easy. <laughs> we all know Los Angeles has not done public transportation <laughs> it was, well. It was like a little train that goes to the neighborhood of Make Believe. It just goes like <laughs> four feet. <laughs> yeah, it's very strange. Anyway, I mean, it gets a lot of the noir stuff right, I think. Uh, the, the feel is really good. A lot of the characters, I think, do a good job of... You know, playing to some of the noir cliches, but with enough of a, at least for the major characters, enough of a twist or a little something that's different uh, to make it not seem tired or if it's just kind of, you know, really super tired. I mean, I'd love for you just to elaborate for one second, because you are a noir writer. You've written these like three critically acclaimed noir novels. What are the, quote, noir elements or cliches that, like, make a noir story a noir story? I mean, I feel like I know it when I see it, but there have to be, like, things, right? Checklists? Yeah, well, I think, you know, there, there's a bunch of things. One, I think, especially for movies and TV, is you have that particular sort of dark atmosphere. Generally, noir stuff has one person or, you know, a very, very small group of people who are sort of up against a system which they can't really fight against. There's generally a class aspect to it, which you which you definitely see play out here, especially in the church, sort of the wealthy elders, obviously crime, corrupt police. Uh, it's a very, it's you know, it's a cynical take on the world in that in sort of the darkest noir, the heroes, they can't really win. Mm. You know, they're always they're always going to get crushed by these larger forces in society that and they just they don't have access to that or they don't they don't have enough sort of personal power. Even if they win small victories, the system at large will continue on. I mean, did Toby not just describe Veronica Mars, Kevin? Well, he, he did. <laughs> he did. And so when you break them, when you deconstruct noir, I mean, think about neo-noir, which mm. is more modern stuff. Like Veronica Mars? Like Veronica Mars or Dare Me mm-hmm. or these other kinds of shows where they don't have the hard-boiled detective in them. But what they do have is the same feature that the world is that there's a good world and a bad world, a dangerous world. And our protagonist is maybe morally uh, ambiguous or they are world weary. They can bring us, the audience, to that dark world, Mm -hmm. that evil world, but bring us back Mm. and show us, you know, what's what's going on there. And usually that other world is kind of sleazy and dangerous. And, you know, Toby's right. The the hero never really wins. Mm. And, you know, there's beaten up a lot along yeah, the way. Yeah. And they're yeah. like, you know, there are great writers like Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett, Mickey Splain, who have done these characters. And it's a great subgenre of crime. Mm. I mean, I, I really can't tell you. I mean, if you fair viewers and listeners have not watched the series Veronica Mars, it is probably the most noir thing that's been produced in the last couple of decades in modern pop culture. And it's brilliant. It's about a teenage detective who is hard-boiled, by the way, who in the first season is trying to solve her own rape, which is oh. pretty much as dark as it gets. Oh, wow. Um, it's very, very good. Laura Bricker, a uh, question for you. Some of the themes of the series, one of the things that comes up again and again yeah. are gender roles and sort of some very stereotypical uh, sort of views through the pop culture lens of men and women, and then also yeah. a couple things that stick out. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that was something that definitely stuck out to me when I'm looking at this, because I'm looking at the time period that this is is taking place in and when they're having press conferences all the reporters are men they all have like cigars you know then we have Della who is clearly much more competent than the male attorneys and she is relegated to like answering the phones and like finding this guy's shoes and when she's not there he can't even take his darn shoes off at night you know and then we also have the police officer the one that's kind of the nemesis who's at the Uh, House of Ill Repute, Mm. um, which again felt very stereotypical, but I felt like there was a lot of themes of the women were being downplayed and the men were in positions of power right out into the point where we see the church scenes with Mm. Sister Alice and her mother. And Sister Alice is, you know, a woman who's speaking her mind and she's a strong woman. And that is very threatening to the men. We decided this as a group. away from hysterical women. You will censor the sister, or the spigot will be turned off. 
I'm afraid it's not a discussion, Mother McKeegan. Um, so, Toby, I do have a question for you about Sister Alice. Something you sent me in your notes. I was watching this the whole time, and, of course, I was just thinking, Scientology, 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 sort of L.A.-based church that has a lot of uh, imagery that looks a whole lot like L. Ron Hubbard at its center with the boats and the Navy outfits and so forth. But there is another real-life person who you think this is inspired by. Can you please talk about that? Uh, sure. I, I, I'm i pretty sure it's inspired by uh, a woman named Sister Amy Semple McPherson. You got it, yeah. Which I, I think is about the same time. Uh, I believe she was also in L.A. She was another sort of radio uh, evangelical preacher who uh, was the biggest of, of that type for a while in the country. I did a, I did a quick read up on her because I hadn't... I think she was in the Book of Lists or something. I can't hmm. remember where I first ran across her, but it was when I was the a kid. The Book of Lists, that thing you keep in your bathroom, like at your grandparents' house, that one? Uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I have not been to your grandparents' house. That's how I remember Next the Book of Lists. Next to Dianetics. <laughs> Didn't she fake her own kidnapping, Toby? Yeah, th- so there was a kidnapping that it wasn't really clear uh, whether it was real or, or not. I think she was accused of adultery. Hmm. Like, I think the show does a pretty good job of showing sort of the kind of stress and restraint that that Sister Alice is under that would sort of lead her to to want to fake her own kidnapping, to sort of gain a little bit more control over her own life. Yeah. But I think it's one of the one of the good parts of this is that dynamic between Sister Alice and these these male elders in the church in that, you know, who's got the power in this relationship? Right. I mean, everybody's going to see Sister Alice and they can, as much as possible, try and put restraints on her. But when she gets a feeling, she just kind of goes off. Mm. But they have the purse strings. So it's this sort of push and pull between the two of them. And it'll be interesting to see how that kind of plays out. And we should say, too, Sister Alice's mother, played by the great Lily Taylor, one of my favorite yeah. Gen X. Oh, is that Lily Taylor? I was wondering who that was. <laughs> I'm just trying yeah. to figure out though, like, what Sister Alice has to do with the story. I mean, she and Perry Mason are going to fuck, right? No. Oh, I don't Oh, really? They're totally going to so. fuck. <laughs> I think the church is behind the whole thing. I think that's what it has to do with. Is that what the, the snakes were foreshadowing? <laughs> that was a good scene. <laughs> that was an incredible scene. Do you like sweets, sister? I would eat them for breakfast, lunch, and dinner if I could. Me too. Maybe we split some right now? What do you say? Laura, was that not an incredible jump scare opening scene to that episode? Well, I will say it was because I will tell you snakes are probably my biggest phobia. And pastry boxes are your favorite thing. So you would totally fall for that same trick. <laughs> I would if they came over and they said, we have some raspberry white chocolate scones for you, Sister Lara. Would you like some? I'd be like, sure. Uh, so, yeah, no, I actually like jumped up when that scene came on. I was like, oh, my God, does it have to be a snake? Really? Yes, indeed. <laughs> was that not a great scene? It was a great scene. The house looks You made me rewind it. It looks just like the Walsh's house from Beverly Hills 90210, this like idyllic Beverly <laughs> Hills setting, Spanish style architecture. Yeah. They walk out into the beautiful yard. The little girl looks so beautiful and sweet and then just turns into like an exorcist priest, like in four seconds with screaming and histrionics. Yeah. It's frightening. Toby, there are also some kind of gross out gore scenes in the show. You know, we have a lot of close ups of dead people with, you know, blown out eyeballs and faces. Of course, we have the uh, many close ups of a dead baby with its eyes sewn open. And we have that weird denture scene where Ugh. like he finds the dent and he's like popping it into the Georgia, poor dead George's face. What do you think of uh, about that choice to have so much gore and kind of like gross out stuff in the series. Yeah, I was trying to get a handle on that. I mean, it seems like a strange choice because it doesn't really add a ton to the story, I don't think. I mean, I, I guess you could say that the denture thing maybe, but I don't think you have to do it in quite the uh, sort of dramatically graphic way that they do. You know, it just seems like it would turn some people off quite a bit. Hmm. It's not like it happened in... Uh, a show that you would take as more realistic. Like if it had happened in um, The Night Of or something like that, mm. I think it would have a different impact than something like this, which you realize- We did get the feet scenes in The Night Of, though, which were pretty gross. Well, there was a lot of like <laughs> close-ups of dead 
corpses genitals in this show too and i was like right really a lot of pain and i'm like i'm like we saw a lot of that and i saw that in uh west world when they would go in that room in west world where they'd be like okay now you're all like dead robots you live in here but this was like hbo's got all kinds of snakes yeah they've got a lot of visual motif but i was like is it is it that we're supposed to like have this feeling that mortuaries and medical examiners were uh much less sophisticated so they just had piles of bodies everywhere Mm. i I don't know i do want to talk about all the mortuary scenes because our medical examiner in this series as sort of a fun joke to people who watch other crime shows Mm -hmm. uh is played by hey it's that guy actor whose name i don't know i'll be honest but i know he's hey it's that guy actor i'll plug it in right here he appeared in Many episodes of Law and Order SVU as a medical examiner who actually turned out to be a murderer. Of course. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he just has that perfect, like, pallid medical examiner, I never go outside in the sun kind of theater guy face for the role. But also, he has a very interesting relationship with Perry Mason and his investigations. Laura, I would love just to hear about a couple of these scenes from you as a as a former defense investigator. What do you think of Perry Mason going to the morgue to buy clothing and accessories from dead people from this medical examiner? How's this? I like it better than the suit. I got a domestic stabbing with a three-piece, if you want. That was a bit much, Perry Mason. (laughs) I mean, seriously? It's not like you have nothing else going on. Yeah, I was just, I I think it was almost like a shock value. Like, we were supposed to sort of feel like that Perry Mason has been in the war, and he's so jaded, and he's so damaged that he doesn't even, like, care that he's buying a tie off of a dead body that's probably going to stink like a dead body. As he's like, we, you know, we go from that, which was just, like, super nonchalant. Like, he's like, oh, hey, what do you, you know, oh, that one looks good. Yeah, okay, I got to go to court today, so I got to have a tie. To then later, we have Perry and his sidekick, Mm. and they have the medical examiner in the car and they're just out on like, you know, they've got their little flask and they're having a a jauntily good time until all of a sudden they're in Perry's basement out at the dairy farm and whoop, there's another dead body. Yeah. And I'm like, George, I'm like, (laughs) how long has that body been dead? That is so not realistic at this point because that body has been there for so long and he's been popping those dentures in and out. How many times at this point? Yeah. I'm like, no, I'm sorry. There was rigor mortis. There was other things going on here. It's not accurate anymore, Perry Mason. And then they move him to the golf course. (laughs) Yeah. And they're like, hey, now we'll put him out in the sand trap. I'm like, seriously? At that point, the body's going to be falling apart, Perry. Mm. (laughs) I actually did love that where they decided to put it on the golf course so it would end up in in their local mortuary, which is very, very, very (laughs) smart. One of the things that I love, Toby, just in terms of like the loca- using location and setting and, and time really well is Perry Mason's relationship with his next door neighbor slash sort of wannabe landlord. She wants to buy his house, who also flies those planes, which as a viewer, I keep thinking like, oh, those are vintage planes. And I'm like, no, those were just planes <laughs> back then. <laughs> and they go to that like far flung uh, New Year's Eve party so he can gather clues. To me, that's the kind of thing that makes it worth putting a show like this in a setting and a time period like Perry Mason is doing. Do you agree? Oh, yeah, definitely. You have this little episode where you go away from where all the main action is happening and you have this sort of strange interaction and, you know, it gives you a little bit of insight between the two of them a little bit when you get them away from the airfield and uh, a little sense of, of their relationship and her, and her understanding of him. Uh, as being, you know, their their friendship, their friendship or romance or whatever it is, it, it goes so far, like she's suspicious enough that uh, he's actually doing work mm-hmm. when he takes her to this place. Like she's got it in the back of her mind that this isn't just all about me. That like I'm a nice like add on. Uh, <laughs> she's wise to his ways. Yes. Yeah. I don't think she cares. <laughs> That's why she made him jump in the fountain. She's like, screw the you, Perry Mason. <laughs> yeah. It's not like she's. I, I don't think like she's super disappointed. She's like, all right, <laughs> you work. I'll go dance with this other guy exactly (laughs) all right let's do what we do shall we i'd love to know panel do you recommend that our listeners and viewers watch perry mason on hbo is it a thumbs up or thumbs down laura bricker i'm gonna start with you what do you think well i would say this is not the same perry mason that you know i haven't watched it like you rebecca i i didn't watch it either but i've seen clips over the years and perry mason was not as brooding cranky and flawed as the perry mason in this show is however 
There is like beautiful cinematography in this. There's a really great sense of time and place. It's it's a slow start. I definitely found it to be a little bit of a slow start. But overall, once you kind of get cooking with the story at the end of episode three and four, then it's something where I definitely want to keep watching. It's definitely, it's kind of dark. It's it's a dark story. So if you're okay with all of that, um, I would say give it a watch and it is a thumbs up. Toby Ball, what about you? Thumbs up or thumbs down for Perry Mason on HBO. Yeah, as we talked about earlier, I think when you're doing this kind of noir uh, throwback stuff, you, you can't play it straight. You've got you got to have a take. And I think this, this sort of like has a 90% take uh, and I, so I think that's that's good. There's a, a few things that just struck me as as being a little bit cliched without without anything to really offer. Uh, I thought the John Lithgow sort of story arc was pretty lame. And there's a couple other things that are kind of like that, where I don't think it transcends the traditional tropes. But beyond that, I, I thought it was pretty good. I, I give it a, a, a solid thumbs up. Not the most enthusiastic, but but definitely a solid thumbs up. Kevin Flynn, what about you? I, I'm really liking uh, Perry Mason. I think it's a fun show. It's pretty uh, ambitious to take a legacy character, even if you know most people just only know him by name and don't really know a lot about mm. who Perry Mason like is, me. like you, <laughs> and then drop him in sort of this new situation. Um, if this were Atticus Finch, Private Eye, <laughs> you know, would it be as uh, as dreary as uh, as and his this office is? assistant Boo Radley? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Scout run down to the morgue. <laughs> Get Daddy a tie. <laughs> yeah, but look, I'm a thumbs up for this. I. I uh, I am liking a uh, you know L.A. noir style reimagining of the character, and the mystery itself is kind of interesting. It's an open mystery, right? It's that style where we know sort of sort of who's involved. We don't know why yet, so there's still more to go. Uh, I am looking forward every Sunday to watch this. I really, really like Perry Mason. I'm giving it a big thumbs up, uh, in no small part because I love Matthew Reese so much. But I also do love, to me, there is an, uh, a thread here that feels extremely timely. There's definitely like kind of like an anti-cop streak to the storytelling that just feels very of the moment in a way that I'm not sure the showrunners necessarily were expecting that would be timely when they wrote the show, I don't know, two years ago, or however long production the show has been in production. Uh, it's also just weird. And I really, really like things that are weird. I like things that feel like there's something a little bit off and Perry Mason delivers absolutely that. So big thumbs up. Do you ever meet someone who seems kind of off? Whether it's a creepy neighbor or random phone number that keeps calling you, Truthfinder has you covered. You can search for people by name, address, phone number, email, and more. Truthfinder can be especially helpful for running confidential background checks on anyone you're planning to meet from online dating apps. Go to truthfinder.com slash podcast for a special offer. That's truthfinder.com slash podcasts to access your special offer today. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounders. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home for me. All right, Kevin, we need to do a little bit of business before we continue on with the show, okay? Okay. We need to talk about what's coming up on Patreon tonight and our Patreon exclusive Crime Writers on After Show. Mm -hmm. I do have a little bit more to talk about about the Ghislaine Maxwell arrest and a little detective work that I was a part of around that, which Mm -hmm. was really fun. And then I also want to ask Toby about the case inside an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, which he probably hasn't watched but might know about, the Berkshire's UFO incident. All right. 
right. I watched it. All right. So we will talk about that in our Patreon exclusive Crime Writers on After Show. If you want to listen to that right now, go to patreon.com slash partners in crime media and sign up. Our after show is always super fun. Plus, we're going to have a new Mary with podcast out soon. Plus, we have a new Leave it to Bricker podcast out now. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a new Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club coming out soon. So we have tons of content there. Plus, you can listen to our whole back catalog of all those great shows right now at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. Kevin, Mm -hmm. do we have any Patreon patron saints of the week this week? We do. Nanita Cranford and Chris Brooks. (laughs) Bless you. Yes. Yes. I love both of these listeners so much. Nanita and I, not only are we podcast friends, we're also in-person friends. Wow. <laughs> She's going to be on the deep dive soon. Oh, she is? Really? Yes. Oh, I'm so excited about that. Of course, she might be better known to some of our other super fans by her Twitter handle. Which is? Javachik. Yeah. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Didn't she just move? She just moved. She did. She did. You can follow her adventures of dogs and moving and mayonnaise brands changing from coast to coast, which Mm -hmm. is a thing I didn't know about. Uh, (laughs) But following her. Did you know that Hellman's is not Hellman's west of the Rockies? Yes. It's called Best Foods? Yes. I had no idea. Well, we have listeners that knew that. I'm shocked. That could be a whole topic of a a Patreon after show. He only keeps up on that awful stuff. What was it? Miracle Whip. Miracle Whip. <laughs> I've come to really which, enjoy the, the way, tangy taste which of Miracle Whip. He said on this show that he hated and that has become an acquired taste and it's making me crazy. Hey, I had to finish the jar. It's good with tomatoes on bread because it's kind of tangy, but that's Yuck. the only yeah. way I'll eat it. Put it in a crepe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Should we do our second review of the podcast? Would love to. Moving on. The victim was laying over to the right side of the vehicle, you know, sitting in the driver's seat. Laying over like the console area, you know. In 2012, Gellere Bagarzade of Houston was shot in her car outside of her home. Police were stumped not only as to who the killer was, but why someone would want the graduate student and political activist dead. Gellere Bagarzade was a radiant woman. She had countless friends. She was funny, crazy, full of energy, everything packaged in a tiny body. Gellaray was studying molecular genetics at MD Anderson in Houston. She dreamt of one day becoming a CSI expert and helping police solve violent crimes. Instead, she became the center of one. After friends, family, and lovers are eliminated, the case goes cold. That is until another murder occurs, one with a curious connection to Gellaray's. This was an investigation that would leave the city of Houston on edge as police looked for a killer who was lurking in the shadows. They accounted for uh, seven strikes on his body. It would leave everyone wondering, how do you catch a killer whose motive is unimaginable? After its success with The Thing About Pam, Dateline and NBC News are back with a new podcast, Motive for Murder. Reporter Josh Mankiewicz dives into this case a new, or is it simply an audio recycling of a Dateline episode? Now, we are going to be talking about plot points for Motive for Murder, so to remain spoiler-free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes to hear our thumbs up or thumbs down review. Laura Bricker, I've seen all of your notes. Yes. And I know how some of you feel about this podcast. Uh, and it's different, different from how I feel, which is refreshing. However, I just want to ask you about the format here. Yeah. It is very, very straight in terms of there's a beginning, there's a middle, and an end. Yeah. And unlike other podcasts we've reviewed recently, I was never lost as to what was happening, who was who, or where it was going, do you agree? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think my biggest criticism of this, I think, is that the writing is just super bad and cheesy and like just drove me nuts. But I will say, they tell the story in a way that I want to keep listening. So, you know, they end each episode on a cliffhanger. They definitely parcel out information in such a way that you're learning information kind of at the same way that maybe the investigation is unfolding so that you're not, you know, revealing everything up front. So, you know, I definitely knew that I could follow the story. I mean, we have reviewed a lot of podcasts on here where I'm like, what just happened? 
because they're either like too information dense or they just don't have good structure. And, you know, writing aside, I could follow the story. Toby Ball, you have some complaints about the writing in this podcast, correct? It's horrible. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me more. (laughs) Well, I don't even, you know, there was a point at which I was like, if I continue to just focus on the way this is written, I won't be able to get through it. But just like, just in the very beginning, in the first episode, there's something about, I think it's when her buddy uh, was listening to her last like seconds and Mankiewicz says, you know, he heard his friends scream. It came from the bottom of Galloway's lungs. And then finally, silence. And it's like, <laughs> what are you even talking about? You know, that that doesn't mean anything. What the fuck? So anyway, it's just that whole thing. I was like, what? why didn't somebody just push back and say, you, you don't know any of this shit? Like, just say it was a scream. <laughs> like, this, all the rest of it is just bullshit that, that you're making up, and it's cliched. Did you feel like Toby's never actually watched Dateline? <laughs> no, but I feel like he needs, like, my my thunder and lightning sound effects right now. He sounds like me. He's very enraged. Yeah. It gets worse. I actually was not as offended by the... I mean, I am always a critique of terrible writing. And I actually was listening to the writing and I'm like, this is not good. But I think in my mind, because it's a Dateline product and I'm so familiar with the format that I forgave some of the prose because of the structure being so tight, just in the way that the story is laid out. I mean, they even do a thing where they make you feel for five minutes at a time as if a new character they're introducing is mm-hmm. probably the murderer, but then immediately kind of absolve it by explaining why. I just felt it was there was a straightness to it that to me made the cheesy writing less offensive. Do you agree or disagree? I always agree with you, Rebecca. <laughs> Do you have a different question? Smart choice. <laughs> Look, it's funny. You know, my theories about the crime like seem to come like right along with the narrative. So in the way, I was kind of like a boat on a river. Mm. And so they did a great job of inception. I mean, was, I, all my thinking was sort of matching with their writing and structure. I was like, a twin? What about that twin? <laughs> and, and, and so just, you know, just, I, just, just as I think I'm getting ahead, they were bringing me there. So, you know, it is it is very typical Dateline. It's, you know, not a Peabody Award winning yeah. investigation. Yeah. But they told a story that, yeah, it was complete. You know, middle and end. Beginning, middle and end. True crime stories have started to offer a familiar experience. A life taken too soon. A hunt for the killer. And then finally, we hope, a measure of justice. Beginning, middle, end. A certain satisfaction comes with that completeness. And I think, you know, I was in the river, too, because I listened to the whole thing today and I kept popping out of rooms and saying, I think Nazreen did it. And then five minutes later, I don't think Nazreen did it. Well, look, (laughs) the advantage that Dateline has over our other podcasting friends is that they have the resources, right? They can go wherever they need to go to do the interview. To a prison. To a prison. They Across can fly the country. Here, you fly there. Not everyone can do that. They do it very easily. But the other thing is their story selection is very good. Because well, they have they, a formula to the story selection. They, they do. But then you look at sort of the breadth of crimes, they really pick ones that work for them and that can be told. Because that is always sort of like the knock on a lot of the true crime podcasts. So many are bad because they pick stories that they actually cannot tell. Right. There's no ending to them. There's no end to the mystery. There's no sources. Who no will speak sources. Up, yeah. There's even the ones where, you know, you can have a, you know, an unsolved case and it still be a very compelling podcast. But a lot of the problems are baked right in because the crime itself, they aren't limited to the crime in my backyard because they're covering the entire country and they have the time to spend years on a case like this one. Kevin, are you surprised to hear and we'll, we'll talk about this in a second, how much they tell the sausages made about Dave? Line, but Mm -hmm. that these producers spend years pursuing these sources. I mean, these producers, like, I'm I'm always surprised. I think we heard the same thing and thing about Pam. Where, you know, Keith Morrison or Josh Mankiewicz, they sort of fly in, they do the final sort of interviews and whatever. These producers are in touch with these sources for years. Mm -hmm. That really surprises me. I mean, they're not writing a book. They're just trying to put together a 30 minute TV package, right? Well, I mean, that's that's it. If if one producer leaves to go work at CBS, the institutional knowledge like keeps the story. You, right. you know, they've been around for 20, 30 years, right. whatever it right. is. Right. So, again, you know, they're 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 built for this kind of news gathering. They're not necessarily built for this kind of storytelling. 
Right. So, Toby, I felt like maybe you wanted to say a little something a minute ago. What was that going to be? Oh, I was just going to say that, I, you know, part of it also is that they choose stories that are done. Mm. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not really an investigative podcast. It's telling a story about a crime that's been solved. Right. I mean, it's not it's not yeah. doing what like Madeline does or or Amber or, or somebody else who's going to take a look at something and seeing what happened. Like that's already known. And I, I will say just as a journalistic note, we really are in reporting trying to move away from the quote, comma, police said method of reporting. Mm-hmm. And Dateline has not quite caught up on the skepticism about the official vo- quote, official voice of law enforcement mm-hmm. in terms of driving their narrative forward. I mean, really, it's like they got the police report and then just chased down everybody in the police report sometimes to stitch the narrative together. Mm-hmm. At least that's, that's how this story feels. Uh, Laura, I want to talk about Josh Mankiewicz for a second. As our, our yeah. friends at Date with Dateline call him, uh, our friend Mankey and uh, the, the, the wearer of the Mankey Hankies, which is a segment on their podcast. Okay. Sorry, Josh Mankiewicz, you're listening to this. You're probably not, but you might be. I do hear you are very, very sweet. But he's no Keith Morrison, right, Laura? He doesn't have that quite like smarmy character. Yeah. 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 So, but he does talk a little bit about being a local reporter and how that prepares you for doing this kind of storytelling, specifically talking to a lot of mm-hmm. victims. Can yeah. you talk about that? Because you are and were a local reporter for a really long time. Yeah. Actually, when he made that statement about how local, he started as a local reporter and that sort of prepared him for the work that he was doing with Dateline, I totally related to that because, you know, when you are a local reporter, you get sent out on everything. And I remember on September 11th, I was sent out to a house in one of our local communities where a dispatcher I knew at the police station, his sister was one of the people that was killed in one of the planes. And I had to go knock on their door. And I remember I like, I think I almost like burst into tears because I just felt so horrible. But having that ability to, you know, show your compassion and show your humanity when you go out to speak to people about horrible things that have happened to them is, I think, what actually, you know, helps, you know, not only get the story, but also helps people feel comfortable and know that you're not just there, um, you know, in like a vulture-like way. And I think it is it is good training because you do have to go out and you have to just sort of get, I mean, like, I don't know how many times I used to, like, and Kevin's probably experienced this, you have to go find somebody whose family member was just killed in a car accident or was a victim of murder or even committed suicide. And, you know, it feels awful, but he also touched upon this and as he was talking about why people tell their stories, because this is an opportunity for those survivors to remember the person that they lost in a way that is not just as the victim of a crime, but who they were. Yeah. I I will say, though, Mankey does lay it on a little thick with the benefit to people. Oh, yeah. Of t- oh, yeah. Talking to mm-hmm. TV shows like Dateline. This is whole extended passage about all that they stand to gain. And it's like, yeah, come on, Mankey. We know why <laughs> you want them to talk to you. Well, I mean, <laughs> if they talk to him, he'll text them while they're in lockdown and COVID. So they have somebody to talk to, Rebecca. Up. True, true. <laughs> working his sources. Toby, question for you. Do you think Josh Mankiewicz has any experience with true crime reporting? You know, I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. and, but he, he mentioned it about 180 times. <laughs> Over the years, I've interviewed plenty of criminals, most of them murderers. Those conversations always make me think about good and evil and about the false steps that can so quickly take you from one to the other. Yet another tell, don't show moment. There's another one of those that you sent me a note about that is more serious, where you talk about the framing device of the podcast being, quote, stupid. What did you mean by that, Toby? <laughs> you like that turn of phrase? Um, <laughs> it's stellar writing. <laughs> yeah. So, well, he talked in the beginning, and, and this is sort of this weird frame that he uses, is he talks about his buddy, the homicide cop, which, okay, whatever. <laughs> and, and he has these three reasons why uh, murders happen. A friend of mine who's a homicide detective says all murders can be chalked up to either love, money, or pride. And this mystery would be no exception. Was it love? I think we were head over heels for one another. Money. Over the years, he had accumulated hundreds of thousands of dollars in his account. He didn't miss an angle, did he? No, sir. There was a pattern. Or pride. It's just a man's pride 
being walked all over by a tiny woman. That was his ego that she stepped all over. You go through the different motives and each one has an example that points to the husband or boyfriend. Right. It's like, Bunny, I don't want to pay alimony. Pride. (laughs) She dumped me. So it's like any one of them, like the most obvious possible suspect, you can point to any one of those. But in this case, it's all three. (laughs) They don't even, that doesn't even make any sense because at the end they find out who did it and they're like, oh yeah, so in this case it was pride. It's like, that's not the way you explain it in the first place. It was, you figure out which one it is and then that helps you narrow down who the suspects are. And unless of course it's the boyfriend, in which case it could be like any of those things point to him. But otherwise, the whole idea is some kind of weird investigative like hand up. That's not the way it works in this podcast after he lays it out as though it would. So it just it just doesn't make any sense. I don't know why somebody didn't look at it and be like, dude, why do you talk about this if you're not actually going to use it in the show? Right. And I, I think there's a reasonable, actually more than reasonable case to be made that the killing wasn't about pride at all. It was about an abusive narcissist who wanted to control everything around him and his fucked up family dynamics. That's pride. <laughs> it is? I mean, it's a form of pride. Is I mean, it? Pride is, a, pride is a sin well, and an evil thing. I mean, I, I also a- wouldn't... I mean, I think, I think pride is putting a very fancy name on what really just boils down to being an abusive narcissist who kills people when he can't control them. I mean, that's that's psychopathy, not pride, right? Well, (laughs) potato, potato. Kevin, I think you and I may have another point of disagreement on the podcast. I just want to ask you about this. I think the show tries to dispense with the rumors about this being a, quote, honor killing, Mm -hmm. which is very much a blanket term uh, that covers a lot of racism and the way people view crimes committed by uh, people of certain ethnic origins or religious backgrounds. I think the podcast tries to dispense with it by saying it isn't this and here's why. But to me, then they make a mistake by saying, here's what that is. Okay, yeah. I I just feel like they just should have not given that theory any oxygen if they were just going to dispel it because it just added a racial and xenophobic element to the storytelling that made me uncomfortable. Yeah, you know, I I think he brought it up because this is the shorthand that the local media use when they talk about this case. It's like honor killing case goes to court. Yeah. So, you know, to at least take a look at, say, okay, well, it's not an honor killing. Here's some of the reasons why. I, you know, they, I think they get maybe not a, an A plus, but a C plus for at least addressing that issue and trying to elevate it a little bit. But to sort of say, it's not this because this is what an honor killing actually is. But it's terrible. Yeah. Because <laughs> it actually gives oxygen and validity to a thing that is barely a thing. Well, you got to say all the good things about what they thought about that, you know? Yeah. About how it's. You know, cheap and easy and racist and stuff. You don't let me say anything. All right, go ahead, say. Go ahead, say. It's cheap, easy, racist. You know you want to. Cheap, easy, racist. It's just what they try to do to Adnan Syed. Yeah. In his case, you know what I mean. Uh, Kevin, you also agree that Josh Mankiewicz is no Keith Morrison, right? When I think of empathic reporter, I am not thinking of Josh Mankiewicz. (laughs) What are you thinking of? His hankies? You know, he tells a good story. He's perfectly uh suited for dateline nbc and you know he's sort of built for that it comes down to though are all of those skills transferable to a true crime podcast it's like saying though are all your tv skills transferable to radio mm. and to not for everybody keith morrison did it very well yeah even toby gave that show a thumbs up even uh, yeah for a lot of it. reasons that have to do with <laughs> keith morrison uh, but uh manko it's, it's, it's good he's serviceable he's you know he's He's fine. It's really sort of the story here that's what's uh, holding it together. Laura, I do just want to ask you about our killer in the story, Ali Ersan. A uh, real piece of work. Yeah. What do you think of the scams he perpetrated uh, in addition to the crimes he obviously committed? And what do you think of the fact that Mankey goes to interview him in prison? Well, Rebecca, they always try to interview the killer in Dateline. <laughs> Didn't you hear that part? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Is this a Dateline product? <laughs> You know, I I just thought this guy, like you said, he was like a piece of work. I mean, as the story starts to emerge in the latter half of this podcast series about him and how not only is he like totally bilking the government with like his, what was it, 11 or 12 children by saying he only made $3,000 a year, when his daughter escapes... He's out in her boyfriend's neighborhood handing out flyers trying to like get information and just 
I mean, I think it all becomes very clear what kind of person this is when we then hear Mankey in jail talking to him. And hmm. he is the eternal victim. I mean, this is his his wife. She only did this because they threatened her. It's not they're all out to get him. It's not fair. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, nice try. What do you think of his views on women, Laura Bricker? Uh, don't even get me started, Rebecca. <laughs> Prosecutor said and police say that you're an angry, controlling guy I have not who a... wants his way and becomes violent when he doesn't get it. If I was a controlling guy, I would not have my two daughters going to college, driving their own self, having a car. My daughter stood in court and lied through her teeth. Yeah, so I think that it was really good that they did have that interview with him. And then I do, I do like that they were like, hey, by the way, what about that other guy you killed? Yep. Whoops, uh, where did that come from? I kind of wish we had known a little bit more about that case, but I realized we didn't necessarily need to know that much about that other case, but at the same time, it was kind of like thrown at the last minute. Oh, and by the way, he also killed his last son-in-law. Well, I think we should do what we do. Let's let our listeners know, should they check out Motive for Murder, a follow-up to the dare I say, great podcast, The Thing About Pam from Dateline NBC. Laura Bricker, thumbs up or thumbs down? Do you think our listeners should check out Motive for Murder, the podcast? What do you think? So this is a tricky one because I feel like the writing and the narration for me, I was like, eh. But here's the thing. This is a really interesting case. They have access to everybody involved in the case. Despite the crappy writing, the story is still told in a logical fashion so that you're left hanging at the end of each episode wanting to hear what happens next. And Motive for Murder was a good title because it was a really unique motive. And it was something that took six years to solve and get to trial. So if you can get past the writing, which is um, at some points kind of cringeworthy, the case is pretty interesting. So I'm going to give it a lukewarm thumbs up. Toby Ball, what about you? Thumbs up or thumbs down for Motive for Murder. Uh, I give this a, a thumbs down. I'm surprised that you guys like it as much as you do. <laughs> oh, totally we'll, thinks less of us now. We'll listen to anything. No, I'm just well, it's just really like it, it, there's no bones about it in that it's like sort of a check this out type of thing. And it's it's like, listen to this fucked up story. And, you know, the, the good true crime podcasts that we listen to have something to say about something. You know, they have some comment to make. They're exposing something. This is none of that. The only things that it could potentially look into, it kind of shies away from. And you're just left with this story, you know, it, it sounds like sort of the positives that I've been hearing from people talking is that you can follow the story. <laughs> the bar is so low. <laughs> if that's really the bar, then I guess it passes it. But it, the writing is bad. It doesn't really have much to say. It's really they found this story that like some kind of weird stuff happened. So are you a thumbs down? I, you know, I'm on the fence. <laughs> Uh, He's a thumbs down. I, I was surprised with how lousy I thought this was. So thumbs down. Toby, I'm going to push back at one part of your review. Okay. Because you said this was a, hey guys, listen to how fucked up this story is kind of story. There have been other podcasts we reviewed that have had almost no substance, but that were about like someone's childhood being raised by like hippie pot smugglers. That was literally the same thing. Didn't reveal anything, didn't whenever. It was just like the kind of story you could sit around telling at a bar and you have loved those podcasts. So maybe this just isn't the kind of story that you'd want to hear sitting around at a bar. <laughs> I, I disagree a little bit. Are you talking about uh, uh, disorganized crime? That's one of them. Yeah. That I remember you loving. Yeah, I liked it a lot, but I, did, I, I thought that had more substance than this does. Just about, well, it does. Just about the choices true. people were making with their <laughs> lives and, and things like this. I mean, this is just a like, can you believe it? There's a twin and the dad. <laughs> what a dick. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those. What about you, Kevin Flynn? Well, as podcasts go, I agree. It's pretty basic, but it does have a beginning, middle, and an end, which a lot of the stuff we listen to do not. It leans a lot on being Dateline NBC, you know, so non-viewers are kind of a step behind. They don't really think about Mickey's hankies or any of that stuff, but it's bingeable. They basically skin the audio elements from a TV episode, so its soul is not a podcast. Yeah. It's a... Uh, it's a synergistic product to promote an episode of Dateline NBC on the same topic, but it does follow the podcast formula and it lands the plane, so I reluctantly give it a thumbs up. 
yeah, I don't love this podcast. I'm giving it a thumbs up and not because the bar is super low. I actually think there's a lot that podcast producers, both, you know, newish producers and also some producers at some news outlets and producers at place like, dare I say, like Wondery um, could learn from listening to these Dateline podcasts in terms of their structure, in terms of their sort of straightforward carrying you through, not giving you so much that it needs to be 12 episodes long if it doesn't need to be. Mm -hmm. There's a tightness to this that I actually thought was kind of admirable and a very strong adaptation from the TV product. And there, I was troubled by a couple of the elements, like we mentioned, the honor killing, giving it oxygen. I was a little bit troubled by how sloppily Nesreen is portrayed um, in the episodes. I, I kind of felt like her being a runaway. And at one point, we actually do get um, one of the characters in the podcast saying that, like, it's a difference between being scared and not being strong. And she's a very strong person. And I'm like, yeah, I had spent this entire thing thinking that she was like a mouse hiding in a corner. So there were some elements of it I didn't love. The writing is not great. But I got to say, it's like a fairly solid, classic beginning, middle and end true crime story. I think a lot of our listeners will like it, uh, even though it has problems because it's kind of well done for what it is. So yeah, sorry, Toby. Give it a thumbs up. I wish we'd done this on the uh, Facebook watch part so you could see me sadly shaking my head. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever meet someone who seems kind of off? Whether it's a creepy neighbor or random phone number that keeps calling you, Truthfinder has you covered. You can search for people by name, address, phone number, email, and more. Truthfinder can be especially helpful for running confidential background checks on anyone you're planning to meet from online dating apps. Go to truthfinder.com slash podcasts for a special offer. That's truthfinder.com slash podcasts to access your special offer today. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. Now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast, a little something I like to call the crime, crime of, of the, the week. week. If you're trying to keep public health officials from learning you're ignoring pandemic guidelines by throwing a large birthday party, don't order 50 pounds worth of fried chicken. Ambulance drivers in Melbourne, Australia, happened to be at a KFC when an order came in at 1.30 a.m., for 20 combo meals. <laughs> they alerted police who followed the customer back to a party where nearly two dozen people were awaiting those finger licking good breasts and drumsticks. The cops grabbed 16 hungry people hiding under beds and in the garage defying the country's lockdown order. Instead, they got an extra crispy treat, $26,000 in fines for breaking the quarantine and, sadly, no fried chicken. Mm. So, panel, here's my question for you. This group showed very bad judgment, not only for gathering in a pandemic, but also for signaling to the outside world that they were gathering <laughs> during a pandemic. What other things did they do, you think, to give themselves away. Laura Bricker, what do you think? Um, I think they started by sending out an Evite invite to everybody in their contacts list. <laughs> and then once the party started, they did a, a Facebook Live and like hosted a watch party so everybody could watch them eat that fried chicken and maybe come on down. All right. Tell me about what do you think? What else did this group do to signal to the world at large that they were breaking pandemic rules and gathering for a party in Melbourne? Many cases of fosters. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, Kevin? I think the valet parking was a bad idea. <laughs> I'm going to say they also made a run for the border and got themselves a big old pack of Taco Bell tacos. Yeah, of course you'd say that. <laughs> Of course I would. All right. We should probably end it on that note. Laura Bricker, before we do, do we have a cat of the week this week? Cat of the week. 
We do have a cat of the week this week. And I want to say, Rebecca, you got to meet Rocky Flintstone the other day. I did. He's so little. I thought he was going to be so big. He's a handsome cat, isn't he? Very handsome. Yes. Is he the cat of the week? Your own cat? My own cat, Rocky Flintstone. No, he is not. The cat of the week comes to us from Glenn Lyon, an attorney in Atlanta who is one of our listeners. And Glenn says, we have a mostly gray and white cat we found as a kitten behind our house back in November 2018. They were originally looking for a home for her since they already had two rescue dogs, but his wife and kids talked me into keeping her. And she was diagnosed this week with an illness, and they're hoping she's going to be okay, but they're not super optimistic, but she is a very cute gray and white cat. And um, I always love it when people find cats randomly and think that they're going to have them taken to the whatever rescue and then keep them themselves. So yeah. good job, Glenn. That's right. That's just like you. If you found a cat every day, you'd have 750 cats. All right, Laura I Bricker. totally would. <laughs> if folks want to reach out to you online to pitch you their animals to be cat of the week, it can be any kind of animal, not a cat. Or if they just want to follow you on Twitter, how can they find you there? They can find me at Laura Bricker. And Toby Ball, folks want to commiserate with you about being the only only one with good taste on this week's podcast. I guarantee you're going to get a lot of tweets about that. How can they find you on Twitter? At Toby Ball and H. And Kevin Flynn, if folks want to reach out to you and say, hey, it's okay just to keep doing whatever Rebecca wants you to do. How can they find you on Twitter? I'm at Kevin P. Flynn. <laughs> and if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you can find me at Reb Lavoie. Or follow this show on Twitter at Crime Writers On. And you can watch this very podcast on our new show produced exclusively for Facebook Watch. Find it by searching your app or at facebook.com slash watch slash crime writers on podcast i encourage you to join our amazing community in our official crime writers on facebook discussion group we also have a regular old facebook page by the way support this show at patreon.com slash partners in crime media and you will get the crime writers on after show married with podcast toby ball's deep dive book club podcast and laura bricker's leave it to bricker podcast our theme song was performed by the new york Ska jazz ensemble and used with permission our line editor is the very handsome henry lavoy our social media and newsletter maven on maternity leave is fellow taco bell stan meredith plunkett this show was recorded in the yoga loft above the bodega in bay st louis mississippi studio otherwise known as studio c the closet in our basement where we bribe coroners to purchase new neckties all the time on behalf of all the crime writers thanks so much for listening we will catch you later Later. somebody just wrote on that teaser video that you posted on our page this is government manipulation to a one world order wake up people don't let them get by with this (laughs) nice (laughs) what they're on to us we're a one world order we're the crime writers world one world it's not even a new world anymore it's just a one world order (laughs) partners in In crime crime media. media luxury is meant to be livable discover the new leather collection at ashley with premium quality leather sofas recliners and more all built to last No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home.